based, uh, let us say, spring mounted on a flow. Uh, the vortices being created uh, will be created, and then these vortices will create uh, lift force and sinusoidal lift force, and the cylinder can be harmonically excited. It can move up and down. So we are looking for the optimum flow velocities and the stiffness of these cylinders, which can actually enter in locked-in region and can give us a very large displacements, which are useful to generate uh, more energy. So the idea is to make uh, such system efficient uh, by the computational design or use a computational model to you know, design such systems. So this is one big application. Another application, as you can see here in this case, which was published in 2012, uh, these are piezoelectric plates which are being uh, you know, put somewhere in the field, uh, so many of them, and uh, there is no heating involved though. So there are wires you can see which are going uh, collecting the electricity. So uh, this is basically not giving, uh, we are not inputting the electricity, we are generating the electricity. So we are putting them in the flow and they vibrate uh, and then this uh, electricity or the voltage being produced can be collected together. So this is harvesting the ambient air energy uh, in, in this such kind of systems. So there are more applications like bio locomotions and all some, some of these things I will also talk later. Okay, so in order to efficiently uh, model them in a high fidelity environment and uh, uh, you know, to accurate modeling is actually the target. Uh, let us see what do we have. Uh, first of all, the challenge is uh, you could have 3D geometries and uh, moving boundaries. These are the two main characteristics could have in such problems. So when you think of a plate or a membrane, it is essentially a 3D and the boundaries are moving. Those movement can be defined by sinusoidal forcing and uh, there is a constitutive model which governs the deformation of, of such body. So the deformation could be large scale. You can uh, have very large displacements, which is not uh, easy to model in some sense. So small deformations are easier. So this is one of the big challenge here. And the next challenge is geometric and material non-linearity. So the material deforms and of course changing its position and location and the curvature and everything, so that is more geometric non-linearity. Other non-linearity come into picture, just the material itself is not behaving elastically. It is a non-linear elastic model, hyperelastic. Could be any uh, complex material model that also has to be accounted for. Uh, for example, in biomedical engineering, you have tissues which deform and they are all viscoelastic tissues, non-linear viscoelastic tissues. So that kind of uh, constitutive uh, non-linearity, constitutive model non-linearity I'm talking about. And another challenge is the stability of such solvers. So these solvers has to be numerically stable and uh, they have to design and program them such a way that even at uh, small density ratios, solid to fluid, they are stable. So you have to, uh, you know, tightly couple them and under relax them so that they are actually stable. Uh, the choices of computational models, so there are two big choices available here. One is arbitrary Lagrange, Lagrangian Eurasian method, so, and the other is image boundary method. So, of course, the later is the focus of, of present talk. Uh, for ALE, or for short, ALE method uses body conforming mesh. As you can see here in this schematic, if you see the cylinder, the mesh is around the cylinder and there is no mesh inside this cylinder. It is body conformal mesh. And if you think of the movement of this cylinder, you know, in transverse or any directions, the mesh elements or the finite elements will deform. And at some point, uh, they will lose shape and we start losing numerical accuracy. So we have to remesh it. And once you remesh, uh, you have to map the previous time set of solution. So this is something not so trivial. So you have to write efficient algorithms and algorithms which can actually capture the essence of uh, you know, the previous mess and those things. So this is ALE method. Uh, for large deformation, there are always an issue. Uh, small deformations, probably when the mesh is not significantly deformed, it can work well. But for large deformations, you have to think of something like inverse boundary method. Inverse boundary method, the 
the beauty is they work uh, with a fixed Cartesian grid, a background Cartesian grid. And you can think of this picture here. Uh, there is a cylinder boundary being shown and the mesh is shown everywhere. So what we change here is the boundary condition on the on the structure boundary rather than the mesh. So that is something you have to change here and program here in our environment. And they can handle large deformations. Um, you can move uh, back and forth, or still you have to just every time step uh, change the boundary condition. This is another example shown in a very early paper uh, by Bajain. So you can see here an ALE method uh, with the deformation of a membrane where the flow is incoming from left to right is deformed, and you can see the shape of the elements here. They have been squeezed uh, and uh, you know they start losing accuracy and having problems. But uh, these fixed grid methods or partition grid methods or image boundary methods, you can see that they can model in this way. So uh, image boundary method offers a uh, lot of uh, advantages for large scale deformations. And even for stationary cases, uh, they are easy to model. Uh, the biggest advantage is they use a simple partition grid, uh, which is easy to generate. You don't also need any commercial uh, mesh generation softwares, uh, and also you can refine where you, you want, and, and that is the main advantage of the image boundary method. And also, talk about a bit uh, the disadvantage. So, only thing uh, when you have an image boundary method and you want a refinement in a certain place, let us say just this part. So it, you will end up in refining all X and Y both. So, so local refinement is an issue while you deal with immerse boundary methods. So you have to write so-called nested grids and also adaptive refinements. So that is something not so trivial. So that is uh, a disadvantage of immerse boundary method as compared to ALE method, because in ALE method, the local refinement is easy, rather easier because you have uh, you know, finite element grid generation. So let us talk of the coupling uh, of the solvers. If you have fluid solver and structure solver, uh, so primarily there are two approaches: uh, monolithic and partition. And uh, as the name suggests, uh, monolithic is when the fluid and structure uh, these equations are solved simultaneously. You are not distinguishing uh, the, between the equations, and you are solving them at one place. And just this one matrix you are solving. Uh, in the case of partition, uh, you have two different solvers which you are coupling independently and you are iterating between the two. This is more rather practical and uh, easy to do because you already have solvers available from the fluid and the structure and you can couple them easily and you can also test different kind of solvers. Let us say one solid solver is, uh, is not having a constitutive model. So you can actually try another one without even developing it. So it gives us a choice uh, to uh, you know, mix and match uh, in partition approach. But of course, uh, the disadvantage for partition approach is it's large computational time because you keep going uh, between the two solvers and you have to make sure the code is stable, numerically stable. Uh, so these are the couple of our previous paper. We have defined these things in detail. So in this talk, we're going to uh, use a flow solver, which is based on a sharp interface immersed boundary method. And uh, this is uh, also called as ghost cell methodology. We use a finite difference scheme uh, to discretize a second order finite difference scheme in space and time both. And uh, briefly, uh, what we do is we basically identify the cells. So if this is the structure boundary, we identify the fluid cells and uh, then we identify the structure cells in the structure. But there are some cells which, sorry, these are the structure cells, but some cells which are actually close to the boundary, we call them as ghost cells. So this is uh, the definition of ghost cell is it, the one of the neighbor of that ghost cell is actually a fluid cell. And with that definition, you can identify these ghost cells. And on the ghost cells, we have to change the boundary condition. And that is the idea of this and, and how do we determine the cells is, is a easy way. So we draw a normal to that uh, surface and, and then we have a reference point in fluid and from the center of body, we can also draw a, another vector. So we can take the dot product of these two vectors and 
and figure out the uh, different type of cells. So that is the basic methodology we use in this code. Regarding the structure solver, uh, we use an open source finite element method 3D uh, solver called Tahoe. Uh, this was developed at Sandia National Lab and it has a lot of constitutive models available. Geometric and material non-linearity being accounted for in several models. It can handle large scale deformations and, uh, and this is something being tested in the code. Uh, this is a rigid cylinder on which a plate is attached. The plate actually can deform uh, using any constitutive law of your choice. And uh, this, this actually should go to flutter if uh, you start to have the simulation. So that's the done by this code. Now, how do we couple them? So as I said, we are using partition approach. You have a fluid solver and the structure or solid solver. We actually trade them together for a given time step. And once we are done, then we go to different for next time step and then next time step. And this data exchange is the key here. So data exchange is actually the boundary conditions on both fluid and the structure domain. So from the flow solver, we take out the fluid dynamic forces on the surface of the structure. So if I have a cylinder, which is let us say immersed on a spring mounted, uh, I calculate the forces on this cylinder, you know, from the fluid. So that would be, if it is constrained to move in y direction, that would be CL, the lift force on this cylinder. And using that force, I can actually calculate the displacement. Uh, in this case, it's a spring mass system. So I can calculate the displacement of, of this cylinder. And that's exactly what I'm saying. I calculate this force, goes to solid solver, and then it calculates the displacement and surface velocity. Using that, I go back to flow solver. So the flow solver should um, accept that displacement and surface velocity. And then we trade back and forth between the solvers. So that condition should be satisfied. The boundary condition should be satisfied until we move to the next step. So the boundary condition on the, on the fluid side is the displacement of the solid and surface velocity should match, which is actually getting from the solid solver. Uh, the solid solver, the boundary condition is the loading uh, the, from the fluid, the loading should create a displacement. So with that, uh, uh, so these are the mathematically boundary condition. With that, actually, we can uh, couple the two solvers. So the no slip on the surface, which is a kinematic uh, boundary condition. Uh, Rajneesh, do you use uh, explicit solvers? This is an implicit solver. If you use explicit, you will have just one arrow. Yeah, that is what I was thinking. Right. So this is just implicit. We go back and forth, uh, okay. you know, to solver. Explicit is far easier. You calculate the load. You go to structure solver, displacement, and then you go to the next step. Here you have to go back and forth. So explicit, explicit versus implicit, uh, you use when you have certain, uh, you know, conditions or the cases. So explicit is are good enough for small displacements. But if you have a larger displacement within a time step, you have to use implicit. Or if the variation of velocity on the surface is very uh, strongly non-uniform, then also you need implicit. So okay. as the problem becomes tougher, you need implicit coupling. For easier problem like this I'm showing on the slide, that is can be done by explicit. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so I will show you more details actually as in the next slides. So in this case, uh, this coupling is stable at a very low velocities of density ratios. The flow computations are done on Eulerian grid, but the immersed surfaces are tracked in Lagrangian framework. And then you have a coupling, which is called two-way or implicit coupling. And of course, with an under relaxation we are using. So I will show you the details actually. Here are the details. So uh, I think there are a lot of uh, schematics. So I'll go one by one. So I'm just taking an example of a plate which is being deformed, you know, by a fluid. Okay. So velocity is there. The fluid velocity is there. Pressure is there. So at a given step, uh, time step, we have a solution which is, let us say, the position of this uh, plate is 
shown as gamma n. So n is the time step. And this is some um, location here. So this is the variables u, v, w, p, or you can say velocity vector and pressure vector is there. So in a given step, first we call the fluid solver, as you can see here. And uh, when the we call the fluid solver, we can calculate the loading based on the previous. Uh, we actually solve for the for the variable first, uh, u, v, w at n plus one. So we call it. Let us say zero. So zero is actually the substrations between one coupling. So so we re recall that we have fluid and we have solid. And we are actually iterating it, right? So I'm just showing this iterating procedure for just one step. So first we call the fluid solver, calculate the new or revised velocity and pressure field. With that uh, change in the field, I get a new loading and I calculate the loading on the surface and I call the structure solver. I call the structure solver, but that gives me another interface position. Okay, so that is called as gamma n plus one b. Okay, now what could happen that this uh, position may not be satisfying the the conditions of no slip and and the pressure balance. So what we do, we basically under relax this uh, position of uh, what we have obtained, and then we go back again to the fluid solver. With this new under relaxed position, and then we again calculate the loading, then again displacement, then go back again. Then so we can continue this loop until the converges uh, convergence occurs for at least one interface variable. That could be the displacement of the uh, this plate, or it could be also the velocity on the surface of the plate. So. This this procedure actually can be adopted uh, easily. So you calculate first the revised loading. With that revised loading, you calculate the revised displacement, and with that revised displacement, you check whether it has been converged or not. So you can compare the interface displacement or velocity within two iterations, and uh, you can converge it. All right. So this is something easy to implement, and uh, so we we'll do it all the time when they solve the couple set of equations. Whether it is uh, let us say fluid or energy equations, fluid flow and energy equations, or even fluid flow or mass transfer, where coupling is there. So uh, this is more details here. So we call them FSI sub iterations, and you solve first the pressure, sorry, flow and pressure fields, then the forces, then you call the structure solver, deformation and stresses, and then you have a new values of interface. Position and the velocity. Then you can actually declare the so-called unresidual vectors, where you have to declare the convergence. So you can take a maximum of the displacement and the velocity, and then you can test them whether it is converging. If yes, good. If not, then you actually go back to uh, another residual. So here, what I am actually showing additionally, as compared to previous slide, is so-called Atkins method for Dynamic under relaxation. So, if you use under relaxation shown in previous slide, it is constant. So, the the convergence will be linear. So, it will converge, but but slow, rather slowly. So, what you can do, you can use Atkins method uh, shown as here, uh, where you can have a dynamic uh, under relaxation. So, you can increase the under relaxation if if uh, the residual change was larger. That is a big idea. And uh, you can start with a small value of under relaxation, but it will ramp up quickly based on the residual, and that's what it is showing. And going back to that, so that kinds of dynamic under relaxation is already there in the literature. So you can implement here in FSI schemes as well. So let us see the results uh, for uh, this under relaxation as well as the benchmarking uh, using done this code. So uh, the the problem is probably some of you know already. It's a uh, FSI benchmark proposed by uh, to the camp heron uh, 2006 and uh, this cylinder is rigid as you can see and this plate can deform so we expect that the flow will come like this there will be shear layers uh, which starts to deform this plate and at some point vortex shedding will occur from the tip of the plate and that will create a loading uh, transfers to the plate of, uh, and then will be motion 
that motion could be self sustained based on uh, this harmonic loading. So here in this case, the Reynolds number is very small, uh, 100, uh, density ratio is 10, Young modulus non-dimensional is uh, 1.43, and we are using a linear elastic model uh, with geometric non-linearity in, taken into account. So here is the animation. So I'm plotting the vorticity of on the plate. So you can see how the plates get deformed, and you can see at some point the vortex shedding will start to occur and it will sustain uh, its oscillation. There are nice vortices shutting down the uh, downstream in the channel. Sir, so, yes. just wanted to uh, ask one thing that uh, in your one of your earlier slides, you said that uh, you are applying pressure boundary condition on the uh -huh. interface. So are you not including uh, the shear uh, forces? The shear is also there. Uh, okay. Uh, there are two forces on uh, on the plate. One is the pressure, and other is the shear, as you said. The so reason I'm uh, just to simplify yes. simplification sake, I probably I said that. Okay. So both forces no. are there. Yeah. Yes. The reason I said that uh, is because uh, due to these shared vortices, what uh, we have observed is uh, when you initial when you start simulation for this uh, Turecron problem there is uh, some contraction initially due to sh shear which is acting towards the cylinder so right. so there is some sort of compression going on in the plate but later on the right. motion is dom uh, dominated by the pressure and transverse oscillations right. or is all that we see later on yeah so shear uh, is very important if you have low Reynolds number so if you go down to like 20 Reynolds number or 30 very important 100 probably 10 20 percent importance if you just switch off shear versus not switch off i think we saw a difference of like 10 20 percent 10 percent yes. yes. the way this problem has been defined is that you slowly increase velocity so the in the initial stage yeah. uh, i mean shear will dominate right. if you use the exact initial condition that you reckon ron have specified right. Yeah, so, so yeah, we are using here and of course, uh, very important at low Reynolds number. Okay, so so this is the comparison with Turek and Heron. As you can see here, the comparison is good. Uh, so we compare well the frequency and, and the displacement of the plate. And these are again the same snapshots, uh, vorticity uh, shown here in black and white. Now I talked about under relaxation. So here is the comparison how the skin fares. Uh, so let us see this plot. So what I'm plotting actually is, is the convergence at different time instances in the cycle of the plate. So these are T1, T2, T3, and T4. Four different instances have been plot in four different plots just to check whether the convergence is really different uh, in, the, in these four uh, places or four time instances. So first we use a constant under relaxation. So roughly you can say 60 subtractions were required and the convergence was linear as we expected that. Now we talk of under relaxation, which is like a dynamic. And uh, we actually have a band in which we don't want to kind of go away our, uh, our under relaxation. So we don't want to breach this bracket when we talk of under relaxation. So we have set it such that even residual permits us to use, let us say 0 0.8, but we will restrict ourselves to 0 0.4. This is just for the stability reasons, just to check. So within 0.1 and 4, you can see the improvement, drastic improvement here. Uh, roughly, you can see the sub were on the order of 35 or something like that. And if you increase the band a little bit more, you start to have the benefit, but not so much, but, but yeah, still around 30. And that is seen at all the instances. And we actually see a clear improvement, at least as compared uh, to the constant under relaxation, as you can see here, as compared to a dynamic under relaxation. So dynamic under relaxation is good, at least in this problem, because this is something more coupled problem. So normally we don't care too much about uh, uh, the computational time, but in this problem, you have sub iterations at every uh, time steps. And, and uh, let us say you have 10,000 time steps. So you're talking of 30,000 time steps. And each time step, let us is taking, um, let us say, 10, 15 minutes. So the computational time runs on the order of days. 
So in order to reduce that, you actually can use this dynamic and relaxation, which is actually helpful here. Now, uh, we did another benchmark, uh, a similar benchmark, but it was proposed earlier by Wall and Ram uh, in that the challenge is uh, to resolve this thin plate, which is a very thin, uh, thinner than the Turakan Haran problem. The cylinder is square cylinder and uh, it deforms accordingly. And, and the shear vortices and the vortices which create us different than in the case of um, Turakan Haran uh, because of the nature of the problem itself. And uh, although the sustained oscillation is there for the plate, uh, which we actually compare. So this is our results and these are different times. The vorticity has been plotted, uh, you know, in these snapshots. Uh, this is the grid inside the plate. You can see a finite element grid, a very refined grid here. So we are able to resolve the stresses uh, in the plate itself. Here the density ratio is larger. It is actually 84. Young modulus is also larger. Uh, so it was proposed in 1999 and Reynolds number is 333. So there are several studies which have compared the dimensional frequency and plate displacement. And ours was actually also good agreement as compared to other. So in fact, uh, the wall and M data was actually 20% higher than the other data. So that way there is a consensus building uh, that the, the displacement is actually around 0.97 uh, or 0.95. So uh, now let's move on to another validation which we have carried out. Uh, these are slightly easier problems. Vortex induced vibration. So here uh, the cylinder is there, which is elastically mounted and in an open domain. And uh, you can see that incoming flow uh, deforms it uh, using the lift force. And, uh, and this is, uh, sorry what? So this is a comparison of reduced velocity uh, on x-axis with y-axis on uh, the amplitude of the cylinder. And we are plotting several data sets of different uh, studies uh, starting from 2006, 12, 9 and present data. So as you expect, this is initial branch of the VIV of the cylinder and this is lock-in branch and then this desynchronization occurs. So in all studies, the values are very close, as you can see, and uh, our studies are matching well. We actually, there's a big consensus between our studies and other studies as compared to the green one. So this solver actually captures uh, previous data really well. This is for VIV. And then we added thermal buoyancy in the code. So we have a source term in the Y momentum equation and that is done by Buzinet approximation, uh, which does not model the variation of the density in the field, but just create a source term based on uh, the change in the density uh, with respect to the temperature. So it's typically done or very popular in convective heat transfer. So in the presence of thermal buoyancy, the response of the cylinder is different. So if you can see here in this problem, so this is, uh, uh, the flow is coming like this and the cylinder is transversely mounted and um, the gravity direction is this and why I'm showing this way because uh, the thermal buoyancy actually is important. We have gravity which is actually helping thermal buoyancy. So this is an instantaneous response of the cylinder uh, along x directions in this directions and uh, the blue data is the previous one while the black is the current. So we can see that uh, the response of the cylinder is actually matching well uh, with the published data. So here one number is important, uh, which is actually the Richardson number, uh, which is a combination of Grashoff and Renard number. And uh, Grashoff number is coming because we have thermal buoyancy into the picture. We also implemented conjugate heat transfer in the code using the image boundary method. So here we have no deformation. Uh, although we have tested with deformation. So in this case, this is a thin wall, which is actually having a heat transfer uh, to the fluid in a channel. And these are the contours simulated in the present work. And this is published work. And this is a variation of theta across the channel and works uh, compares well 
uh, within the boundary conditions applied on the wall of the channel. And then we compared the natural and mixed convection. So this is just basic test of a solver. And you can see that this is the cavity where we have both natural and mixed and we are comparing the, the velocities at the, the mid sections and uh, different for different Rayleigh numbers. And they are in good agreement. And there's another comparison for uh, the buoyancy and uh, and then that was done it was a 2000 paper by professor Kul sharma and uh, you can see that uh, the uh, the nozzle number on the surface of the cylinder actually matches well including on the corners uh, with the previous study so so you have to actually refine the grid enough so that you capture the the Reynolds number at the corner then we have compared coupled conjugate heat transfer along with natural convection mode. And this is something done already when we compared well with the previous data. So this is a cavity where we have a thick wall and then we uh, compare the conjugate heat transfer and the, uh, the fluid flow in the cavity. And these are the results. I'm not just going in detail, but, but the temperature profiles actually matches well uh, with the previous data. Uh, this uh, validation was done for uh, applications in insect flying or bio locomotion. So, uh, what actually they modeled is a moving ellipse in two strokes. One is the forward stroke, the black. You can see the ellipse moves, and it is actually the wing of the, uh, the insect, and uh, it moves in a way that it also changes its position. So, this is a forward stroke. And then there's something called backward stroke. So it goes back to its original position, but in a different way. So that can be easily uh, set it in the code as a prescribed motion of this rigid uh, wing. And the uh, validation has been done by previous studies for this problem. So this is particular study 2006, uh, Shu and Wong. So this is an ellipse in their study, and this is in our study. So qualitatively and Quantitatively, we are actually matching well the, uh, you know, the data. This is coefficient of drag we are plotting, and this is the coefficient of lift uh, we are plotting. So as you can see here, coefficient of lift uh, being positive, uh, it's generating lift on on this uh, this ellipse. So it matches well, and and all the vertical structures and flow structures also matches well uh, with good fidelity. Now let's see more applications in uh, thermal augmentations and VIV. So this is a case where we tested thermal buoyancy at low Reynolds number. So there is a huge data on low Reynolds number VIV, including uh, from the group of Professor Sanjay Mittal in IIT Kanpur. Uh, so what we say that okay, you have a low Reynolds number, but if you introduce thermal buoyancy the insufficiency of the VIV should occur earlier as compared to without thermal buoyancy. So this is without thermal buoyancy. You can see a cylinder and uh, there are two plates which we have mounted here to introduce the thermal buoyancy. So we can change the temperature of these plates hot and cold. So this being cold and this being hot and now this being hot and cold. So it will introduce the thermal buoyancy and, and expectation is it will introduce a stronger lift force and it can actually go again in the motion at low and not somewhere. And so what we also did is change the distance between the two plates as you can see here and also the Richardson number to increase or decrease the intensity of thermal buoyancy. So as you can see here, this is our computational domain. Uh, the height is defined. The temperatures are opposite plus and minus. The gravity is there. So once we start um, uh, the, uh, the uh, once we start the motion of the cylinder, you can see that the vortices starts to being shed as compared to case where there's no without thermal buoyancy and there are no vortices being shed. So you can see here how the thermal plumes starts to occur in the case uh, where the plates are being heated and cold and that helps to create the vortex shedding uh, at lower and also. So this is the comparison with respect to the distance of the plate. Uh, so we have two distances simulated, two and three, and you can see that two, you have a larger cylinder displacement and rightfully so because 
if you start increasing the plate distance, the thermal buoyancy effects become weaker, and there is this weaker force on the cylinder, and which will reduce the response of the cylinder. And when there is no thermal buoyancy, you can see that there is no response or the cylinder is not moving. So this shows that you can use thermal buoyancy to introduce a VIV. And here is more characterization of the data at low VIV. So we are plotting uh, displacement of the cylinder, uh, the lift force, uh, the normalized frequency as people do in VIV and the phase angle. Now what we show here, it is a function of mass ratio. It is a function of parental number. It's also a function of Richardson number. So all three effects, we actually test and figure out which is actually more stronger. And uh, this is data shown for a simulation just at different times, how the plumes will start to develop, as you can see here from 34 to 46. And then uh, you go back to 50 and then see, so you can see how the shear layer are changing or evolving themselves uh, to, uh, to the vortices being shed uh, from the tip of the plates. Okay, so this is a data where uh, we show uh, the displacement of the cylinder, maximum displacement as a function of Reynolds number. And uh, what we see that incipience of uh, the Reynolds number is actually as low as four, you can see here. And uh, the displacement actually is slightly nonlinear. We have a larger displacement and uh, this is very not very large actually a bit change uh, as a function of uh, Reynolds number and, and there's some variation some small variation the function of Reynolds number but good thing is we can show that the vortex shedding starts at very low Reynolds number and these are the movies showing the shear layer uh, shear layers vortex shedding thermal plumes uh, in different cases of uh, you know different cases of Richardson number. So here the Richardson number is larger, so a stronger vortex shedding as you can see here. And uh, and this is the thermal plumes. You can see here how they are shedding from the plate. Now let's talk of thermal augmentation using uh, vortex induced vibration. So this thing we talked initially in our talk uh, when we talk about the motivation. So you have a, a cylinder which is being placed in a channel and there is a um, heating from the walls. Let us say at these temperatures are heated and what we are doing here, we are saying, okay, we can put the cylinder in motion up and down and the vortices being, will be created and these vortices will interact with wall and they will improve the heat transfer. That is the idea. So question is asked is how the shape will influence uh, the, the heat transfer uh, on the walls, uh, whether this B cylinder is different than the circular cylinder. Why we choose B cylinder? Because uh, we can think of galloping here. Uh, so the galloping is something which is uh, a, another flow induces uh, vibration response. We actually have more forcing uh, if you have a flat surface of, of one side of the cylinder. So, so that can introduce larger or stronger motions and which can help us to improve the heat transfer more. So that was the idea. And this is a simple spring mass system uh, equation uh, which can be used to model this D cylinder. So first is the response of the D cylinder as compared to circular cylinder. So you can see that I'm plotting um, the reduced velocity on x-axis and y-axis I'm plotting the, the displacement. So typically cylinder response is known. Uh, you have a locked in reason here, initial branch and then desynchronization. Uh, this is done at mass ratio of 10 and you know, number 100. Now what D cylinder shows is, is very different. You start to have a VIV which does not go to desynchronization. It actually transition and then galloping. So the galloping is can be as high as to the very wall of the channel. So this is actually channel wall. Beyond this, of course, it cannot hit the wall because there is an incompressible fluid. But the galloping helps us to recover or to induce very large 
displacements uh, of the cylinder and that can help us uh, to improve the heat transfer and that is the idea. Now here is more data on uh, different kind of VIV response. So you can see that we introduced different type of vortex formation here. So probably if you are familiar with VIV literature, you have different type of vortices, uh, wave patterns, 2S, P plus S, 2P, 2P dash, 2P. So these are probably, if you don't know, two single vortices in a cycle, one pair and one single vortices in a cycle, two pairs. So uh, what I'm plotting is also the frequency response, the contours of frequency response, and, and this is the screw frequency, just to understand uh, the lock-in here of this D cylinder. And as we see that uh, there are multiple frequencies in the lift signal. This is for the lift frequency and, and this is for the displacement of the cylinder. So let me also show you the, uh, the vortex shedding response. So these are the different patterns I'm talking about. Two S is when you have two single vortices. P e plus S, one pair and one single. And 2P is two pairs that will look something like this. So P dash is you could have a pair, but something else also with it, like a single. Now 2T is tertiary, three vortices. And uh, 2D dash also like similar changes with tertiary. And then T plus P. So there could be multiple uh, types possible, and we have discovered many of them while we introduce the variation of uh, you know the reduced velocity in this case uh, so what what i'm showing here is the change in reduced velocity so reduced velocity is changing from left to right as you can see and if you go to the next row again it starts increasing so, so you have different urs increasing to all the way to 20. okay so i started at two but i end up you know plotting at 20. And uh, and as you can see here, uh, as you can see here, this different vortex shedding patterns appear as as we are you know discussing the interaction of these vortices uh, to this wall. So this is a simple single vortex S shown as S S. Here we start to have a pair and S. As you can see, this one is a pair. As you can see here, and this is two pairs being form at UR4, this is 2P vortex shedding, this is again two pairs, then so you can see uh, different kind of variations can appear, a tertiary vortex can appear here at UR6, so that's what I was characterizing here in this slide if I show a tertiary vortex uh, in this range of UR and then 2P dash in this range, 2D dash in this range right 2t dash in this range and 2t plus p in this range so uh, we understand them uh, through the point of view of the viv response so if you also getting this awake response you can also predict what is actually the viv here this error bar kind of symbol shows the displacement of the cylinder so you can see a very high displacement here at larger urs here is the movie which give you a better idea of uh, the, uh, the process. So this is a stationary cylinder where the things are not moving. I have removed the spring. And what I'm plotting is uh, vortices, uh, static case, as you can see. And uh, the isotherms, the walls are heated, shown by red. And the nuzzle number on the wall, the nuzzle number shows the improvement. So now see the uh, movie. So as you can see that, as the vortices is being created, uh, there is not much improvement in the, uh, the heat transfer. Whatever improvement is there, it is just due to the simple flow, the laminar flow on the wall, and, and that is a, just a textbook problem. And, and the idea is if you change the, uh, the configuration to a VIV of a D cylinder, the improvement will occur. And, and let us see. So, this movie being shown at UR12. And now you see couple of things here first when it moves you start to shed more vortices and uh, patterns can be deciphered easily 
and what you see also when these vortices are hitting to the wall they are improving the heat transfer and the thermal boundary layer so look at these plumes which actually comes up when the cylinder goes close to the wall and look at this another number as shown as a signature of the improvement of the heat transfer so you can see here the plumes going there interacting with the wall and then another number actually going up and there is a non uniform improvement in the another number and you can see this peaks also uh, ramping up in the downstream and i'm plotting actually on the two walls so showing that essentially there are changes in the bottom versus top wall they are not really symmetric but but the the improvement is seen on the both cases this white signature showing you uh, the improvement or disruption in thermal boundary layer and that's why you have improvement here and the another number is improving and that is because uh, the d cylinder is able to scatter these vortices all the way to the wall and uh, and that can take up the energy uh, from this wall and into the heat transfer is the comparison and uh, this is the mean result number as a function of reduced velocity so mean actually you can see is uh, comparing well at ur12 there are some changes in top and bottom that's why we saw in the previous slide otherwise we see a decent improvement uh, as compared to a almost a stationary case and uh, and we can also compare the peak values where uh, you know have the larger peak value so largest can actually go up to 70 at low reduced velocity and even can go up to 90 at larger reduced velocity so this is a comparison of nu mean uh, so this is channel flow around 30 simple static dc cylinder slight improvement circular cylinder viv okay not so improvement as compared to static but d section actually goes up to 45 or 46 so it's a large improvement in the d cylinder okay so next is energy harvesting i um, mean just have a look at uh, the simulations we have done for the splitter plate so we discussed about the splitter plate problem and in this slides we have run it again for different mass ratios and uh, different uh, reduced velocities so you can see at certain mass ratios the displacement could be much larger right as you can see here uh, it's pretty large as compared to these cases yeah and uh, this can be used as an energy harvesting application and first let's put the data through uh, so this is shown as a like slide wise response so this is the displacement of the, uh, the cylinder sorry the splitter plate the tip of the splitter plate not the cylinder and the displacement is very large at a certain mass ratio and and the response is actually like a viv response of a plate you have initial excitation lock in and desynchronization and when we tip plotted the y tip we actually saw similar trends here uh, the lock in region the desynchronization the initial excitation and we can explain them uh, through all these viv concepts we have learned and now putting this together on a chart where i'm plotting the mass ratio of the plate to the flexural rigidity so this includes uh, the elasticity of the plate and the thickness as well so you can see here the displacement which is scaled as the symbol size are very large in this region so if you have four compartments of your plate light flexible heavy flexible and heavy stiff and light stiff so somewhere i should be somewhere between light and heavy and not really stiff not really flexible so, so there is some non uh, non monotonic response of the plate displacement and that could be helpful uh, for the energy harvesting last is application in bio locomotion so let us see uh, quickly uh, about this i'm also running out of time a bit so pitching of a rigid aerofoil generates thrust as we know and uh, but if you have a pitching uh, uh, if you have a pitching at a certain frequencies uh, the thrust can be further increased and efficiency can be optimized so, so these are the ideas already exist in the literature so 
a critical Reynolds number and a critical pitching frequency exist uh, to achieve the thrust. And, and this is actually due to reverse von Karman street and where a jet is formed between the two consecutive vortices which generate a thrust force. So here is the comparison which is looking at the vortices behind a cylinder and aerofoil, so which is pitching. So you can see here the typical your one Karman and this is reverse one Karman which actually help to generate the thrust and these are the velocity profiles which showing a jet like response here which is helping to generate the thrust. And now we will have done simulations for the rigid uh, aerofoil pitching and they have shown a re critical Reynolds number and a critical frequency exists uh, to generate the thrust. And what we wanted to understand here is the role of flexibility because we have a solver which can use can be used to simulate the flow induced deformation of, of the flexible bodies and, and uh, this is something common in literature when you fishes, uh, you know, they use their fins which are flow induced, uh, go to flow induced deformation and help to generate the thrust. So these are the fins as you can see here, uh, which fish use uh, to kind of, you know, generate the thrust. So this is simply like a bio inspired idea where you can generate the thrust. We use a simple framework of a plate. Uh, what we do, we pitch this plate uh, with a certain frequency and we also have an elasticity of this plate or the flexural rigidity of this plate so there are two effects here one is pitching another is the flexural rigidity and we'll see what happens whether we can generate thrust or not so this is our simulation data so this is for the rigid plate first we take a rigid plate and see uh, the, uh, the response of the plate in terms of the thrust so we can see we generate thrust as you can see here this thrust is being positive here in this um, component which are shown as uh, the dotted reds and dotted uh, green. So dotted green is shear component, dotted red is pressure component. And what we notice here, the white tape which being sinusoidal pitching actually generate thrust uh, which is different from the sinusoidal pitching. So in a cycle, you actually have two peaks uh, of, of a pitching cycle you have two peaks for the thrust this we wanted to explain and um, what we did we took a first order model to see uh, look at the response so you can have a displacement which is just sinusoidal and then based on that you could have the white displacement which is sinusoidal then you can create a reactive force uh, the reactive force is the mass of fluid displaced into acceleration and if you use this and plot thrust based on this simple model you actually see two peaks. So if you have this sinusoidal pitching, which is shown in red, uh, you end up in actually getting two peaks in a cycle for the thrust. So that simple model explains uh, why uh, the thrust will generate in this way, why you will have two peaks in, one, uh, in a single cycle of the pitching. Now with that, we have an idea of why the thrust generate uh, in this way, and we can now compare it with a flexible one. So this is flexible plate and you can see the peaks have increased larger peaks uh, previously it was right here at six now it has gone up to maximum value of eight or nine so here's the comparison of uh, the one common streets uh, for the rigid as well as the pitching plate so what we see here pitching plate actually which is deforming goes to more deformation and there are slight changes in the reverse one karma that are not much changes in the weight patterns. And here's the movie. If you see the plate, this is the rigid plate, the, the top one. This is the flow induced. And uh, you can see the deformation, a larger deformation. And, and of course, here the vortices are not very smooth because of the coarse thing of the grid. But, but here in this region, the refined grid, you can see the vortices uh, being formed uh, like the reverse one can one straight. Here is one to one comparison of rigid and uh, the flexual, flexible uh, plate. So the amplitude is constant here for the rigid AT. Uh, but in the case of flow induced deformation, you will have a nonlinear relation with the K. So K is the reduced frequency or the non dimensional frequency of the pitching. So we see that uh, the thrust 
actually generates with rigid as keep increasing but in the case of flexible uh, flexible plate there is a non linear or non monotonic response and when you compare the power similar signals appear and when we compare the efficiency which is the propulsion efficiency we actually have larger efficiency for the case of flown juice the formation as you can see here and it also appear at early pitching as you can see here around at 1.2 as compared to this case where it is much later and a lower frequency this is the comparison of velocity in the downstream for both cases and we can see that we have a larger jet like response for the flexible plate this is the comparison of the shapes and we see that at larger reduced velocity the plate goes to second mode which reduces its uh, thrust and efficiency and then we compare different cases of mass ratios and the fluctuating rigidity and shows that the amplitude is maximum at different values of k if you put this data together what we saw is the displacement is maximum and the thrust is maximum when this natural frequency of the plate uh, matches with the pitching frequency and that is something common with all cases and can be used to collapse the data and, and that is a good finding because if you are using a flexible plate you want to tune it in a such a way that uh, you know it is close to the pitching frequency is close to the first mode of natural frequency and this is a comparison of the efficiency which can help us to decide what kind of plate you want uh, for the larger efficiency so i close here uh, i showed a solver which is versatile and based on ib code a lot of applications i showed uh, can be used for energy harvesting thermal augmentation viv and uh, it, it also have lot of potential for do 3d problems i did not show any 3d problems but but we, we have done some 3d problems uh, several benchmarks were shown and proved that could be helpful for other studies also if they want to take and you know use their solver and i think that's about it and of course there are a lot of published paper which you can have a look if you have more questions more details you want and of course you can contact me if you